Um, I don't know if the, the glare from the glasses is causing people to not be able to see. At any rate, alhamdulillah, thank you guys for joining me this evening for um, our Friday night khutbah recap. So I don't know if you guys had an opportunity to, um, you know, to catch the khutbah or if you had a chance to listen to the khutbah. So alhamdulillah, we, every Friday, Friday night, we try to slow the khutbah down a little bit to give everybody an opportunity to process some of the things that we touched on or that we discussed during the khutbah. So today's khutbah was about the, <clears throat> the ghurbah or the strangeness of Islam. Al-ghurbah, ghurbatul islam fi had al-asr. The strangeness of Islam during today's time. And um, We'll, we'll kind of slow it down a little bit and walk through some of the points that we discussed. Um, very important. Uh, you know, I don't know if you guys, you know, paid attention to the khutbah, you know, really focused in, zoomed in. I know a lot of times people are listening to the khutbah while they're at work, they're in their car, you know, there's kids around, whatever the case may be. But sometimes, you know, you have to kind of tune everybody out so you can zone in on what is happening or what is being said during the khutbah. And as I stated to you guys a couple of days ago, um, we have a $9,300 deficit for the uh, demolition project for the, um, you know, for our building, our masjid um, project. So alhamdulillah, we've collected in the area of about $4,000 right now. So we're still about $5,300 short. We're still about $5,300 short. And tonight, inshallah ta'ala, we want to see if we can collect at least $5,000, $5,300. So before I get started, what I want everybody to do, those of you who have $1,000 that you can donate, I need five people. If I can get five people to donate $1,000, then, you know, we can have somebody else donate the other $300 and we can be done with this particular portion of the project. We want to finish the dem demolition portion of the project so that we can begin on construction. All right. So if there's five people listening between Facebook, Instagram, as well as YouTube, if there's five people listening that have a thousand dollars that they can donate, then by all means, hayya bina, by all means, please donate. Donate, inshallah ta'ala, so that we don't have to continue keep asking. If you know you have it, you know you can spare it. Please, you can use our cash app, which is the cash app sign, Rolda Islamic Center, R-A-W-D-A-H, Rolda Islamic Center. Or you can use our Zelle, which is the message's phone number, 302 766 Okay, so... We start off talking about the ghurba, the strangeness of Islam. We said, I, I began the khutbah by stating that the religion of Islam has always represented a unique outlook and perspective on God, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The concept of God in Islam is a very unique concept, starting with the fact that we consider God to be one. God is not three. God is not the son of anyone. God is not the parents of anyone. God is not the father. God is not the son. God is not a female. God is not, you know, anything. So Islam emerges with this message that God is only one. God has no fathers. God has no sons. Something as simple as Kulhu Allahu Ahad Allahu Samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. You know, that is considered one third of the Quran. The shortest surah, the second to the shortest surah in the Quran is considered one third of the Quran because one third of the Quran concentrates on the concept of Tawheed, the concept of God being one, God being unique, God not having any partners, any sons, any daughters, God not being the father. All right. So Islam has always represented a unique outlook on God. 
uh, life, on uh, spirituality as well as moral character. And anyone who uh, you know who adopts the you know the religion of Islam or converts to the religion of Islam takes on this unique perspective. Allah subhanahu wa taala you know reveal ayats to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam stating that he was one. The Bedouin Arabs or the Arabs of Arabia during that time, they said, Has Muhammad made all of our gods one? Indeed, this is a strange thing. So even the Aqidah of Islam is strange. The Aqidah, the belief system of Islam and Muslims was considered strange because this was something that, you know, they hadn't heard before. So it was unique in its Aqidah, in its belief. It was unique in the uh, outlook on life and the hereafter. They didn't, one of the, the, one of the um, concepts that Arabs struggled with was the belief in the hereafter. They did not believe in resurrection. They said, they said that, are you telling us that when we die and become dust and bones, are we going to be resurrected? There is nothing for us except the life of this world. We live and we die and we will never be, you know, resurrected. We will never be brought back to life. This was the concept of the Arabs during that time. So Islam emerges and says, no, there is a hereafter. There is a hereafter. You have to, you know, answer for the things that you've done in this life. You have to answer for the life that God gave you, for the blessings that God gave you. So Islam emerges with this unique perspective on God, on life, spirituality, as well as moral character. And anyone who adopted the religion of Islam by default became a stranger in a society that was wandering aimlessly, you know, in the wilderness of their own misguidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet وسلم, in the Quran, وَإِن تُتِعْ أَكْثَرَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يُضِلُّوكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ That if you were to obey most of the people on earth, they would misguide you. They would lead you astray from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would lead you astray. From the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the majority of the people on earth are misguided. And that's something that we need to understand because that holds true even till today. The vast majority of people on earth are misguided. The vast majority of people on earth are misguided. And that includes Muslims. Muslims are not impervious to that. And so that sets the tone for the acceptance of being unique and being strange. And this is, and I get it, we grow up in a society where, you know, it's not cool to be an oddball. It's not cool to be different, not cool to be unique. We usually like to fit in with everybody else. This is, hence you have the cliques, you have gangs. We try to find people who think like we think, dress like we dress, you know, their approach to life is the same as ours. And we, you know, you know, we, we assimilate and we find ourselves to be amongst that particular group. Look at anyone right now and the group of friends that they have or the gang or the culture, the clique that they are a part of. A lot of it has to do with the similarities that they have in common, the commonalities between them. You look at fraternities and sororities. These, this is all based upon the things that they have in common, the commonalities between them. And people join these things, join these organizations, join these gangs, join these, you know, clubs because they are looking for familiarity based upon, you know, the commonalities that exist between them. And so nobody wants to be the oddball. Nobody wants to take, you know, a path that is different than what everybody else is doing. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why many Muslims, you know, are afraid of coming out as Muslim <laughs> because we want to be accepted by the majority because we tend to think that the majority rules. The majority doesn't rule. The one that holds on to the truth rules 
even if they're by themselves. That is, that is because our gauge as Muslims is completely different. The way that we gauge right and wrong is different than the way that society has taught us to gauge right and wrong. Right and wrong, according to society, is based upon what everybody agrees with. And that is the way that the Dajjal, you know, emerges amongst people because everybody, the people will see the majority of people following the Dajjal and they will automatically assume that maybe he is God. You guys understand? The majority of the people will be followers of the Dajjal, of the Antichrist. And so people will continue to follow him by default that the vast majority of people are following him. The vast majority of people are worshiping him. So it must be right. This is a different scale than the scale that we use in Islam. The scale that we use in Islam is truth and falsehood. Not, you know, majority, you know, minority. Substance, lack of substance. Purpose, lack of purpose. <laughs> you follow me? So you have to ask yourself, if you were a follower, like if, if you guys, um, the Thobe, alhamdulillah, um, and the sister just actually joined, uh, Influence Athleisure. Influence Athleisure. She just actually joined on Instagram. So if you want, sisters, you want to buy a Thobe for your husband, brothers, you, you look at the Thobe and it's nice, very nice quality. Very nice quality, alhamdulillah. I have a few pieces, alhamdulillah. I'm very, very pleased with the quality of the of the thobe. Uh, alhamdulillah, she's on Instagram right now. Um, so you can go ahead and check out her Instagram site. You can order your husband a thobe today. All of the sisters that are listening, order your husband a thobe today, alhamdulillah. Order your husband a thobe today, alhamdulillah. Be nice, it's Friday. <laughs> it's Friday, <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَاعُونَ And they deny small kindnesses. A small kindness, a small gesture of kindness to buy your husband a thaw. Bismillah. You support black businesses, you support Muslim businesses, and it's a win-win for you because you get the hasanat, you're supporting the, the business of our Muslim sister, and on top of that, you are a winner because when your husband sees the thobe and tries it on, and you gas him up by telling him how handsome he looks in the thobe, you, you're a winner all around the board. You're a winner all around the board, and you can thank me later, just make dua for me, alhamdulillah. Okay, so if you are a person that is afraid to stand alone, and I know a lot of people boast, oh, I, you know, I stand alone. Oh, I, you know, I don't follow the crowd, but that is not true. For the vast majority of people, they are followers of the crowd. The vast majority of people are followers of the crowd. I've lived long enough. I've been on this earth long enough to know she has overgarments as well. No, no, I'm advocating for the brothers. Come on, um, Sister Aziza, you, you're messing the game up, man. I'm trying to advocate for the brothers. I'm trying to get the brothers a new thobe. Yeah, she has overgarments too. Yes, she does. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. But I'm advocating for the brothers. Sister, go buy your husband a thobe. Buy your husband a thobe. And then when he gets it and tries it on, tell him how handsome he looks in the thobe. He'll never take it off. I'm looking out for the brothers, man. Don't mess the game up talking about, oh, she has overgarments too. No, 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 no. We, we, that's not what we're doing. We're looking out for the men. We're looking out for the brothers. Sisters, go buy your husband a thobe today. Go to the sister's website and buy a thobe for your husband. Alhamdulillah. Well, if she has a similar, then buy one for yourself and then buy one for your husband. Athleisure. Um, sis, can you drop your um can you drop your tag so uh so everybody can see um your website? Drop your tag so everybody can see where to to purchase. She'll share the tag, inshallah. I 
I, I don't know the sister's name. I know her husband as I should. I'm not supposed to know her. I'm supposed to know her husband. Influence.athleisure. 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 Go to her Instagram site. Go to her website. Influence.athleisure. I'm not going to put the sister's name out there like that. I know her husband. Okay. So, if you are the type of person that likes to follow the crowd, then representing Islam is going to be a bit problematic for you because the religion of Islam, you know, in, in, in all areas, in all facets of the religion, represents a uniqueness. This is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Muslim women in the Quran, Ya Nisa and Nabi, less tunnika ahadim min an nisa. O women of the Prophet, you are not like any other women. You guys follow me. And this is what makes representing Islam to the fullest so challenging and so difficult for many of us because we are so used to, you know, following the crowd and being with everybody else. We are so used to being followers and followers of the crowd and, you know, blending in with everybody else because we don't want to stand alone. When, in fact, Islam is a religion that represents uniqueness. Ya nisa and nabi, less tunnika ahada min an nisa. O women of the Prophet, you are not like any other women. You are unique. The hijab is unique. The jilbab is unique. The fact that you can only marry a Muslim man makes you unique. You, you do not belong to all of the men in the world. You, there's only one type of man that can marry you, and that's a Muslim man. You are unique. So how do you have, how are you a part of a religion that boasts of being unique and different from everything and everyone, yet you are spending so much of your time trying to be like everybody else? You spend so much of your time trying to be like everybody else. And the same thing for Muslim men. Our thinking is different. The way we see the world is different. The way we approach religion and spirituality is different. We're the only religion in the world where we pray five times a day, bare minimum. The only religion in the world. There's no other religion out there where you pray five times a day. You understand? No other religion in the world. So we are unique by default of being Muslim. And, you know, we have, to, we have to learn how to sit in that discomfort. It shouldn't be a discomfort. I personally, myself, I have always been different. I've always dressed different. I've always... You know, my thinking is different. The way I approach the world is different. And yeah, there was a time in my life when I was a follower. But even being a follower, I always found a way to tweak things to make it work for me in the way that I am comfortable. In the way that I am comfortable. I was the same person in Jahiliya before Islam. It'd be pouring down raining outside. I come outside with a white sweatsuit on. And it's like, it's raining outside. I, I know, but this is what I wanted to wear. <laughs> this is how I felt. I don't dress according to the weather. I dress according to how I feel when I wake up. I don't dress according to the weather. I look at how I'm feeling in that moment. I feel like a million bucks. It could be pouring raining outside. It could be snowing, hailing. It could be doing all of that. I wake up feeling like a million bucks. I'm dressing like I got a million bucks. That's how I feel. Why everybody else got on Timberland boots and army fatigue jackets and, you know, sweatpants or whatever the case may be. I come outside with a bright white sweatsuit on, baseball cap. You're like, where are you going? Like, don't you see it's raining out here? It's like, well, this is the way I felt and I don't care. Like, oh, you crazy. Not, that was my thinking. 
Even following the crowd, I found a way to make it work for me. When I converted to Islam, I saw Muslims wearing thobes, but they're wearing thobes with hard bottom shoes. I'm sorry. I'm 21 years old. I don't do hard bottom shoes. I'm sorry. Even now to this day, hard bottom shoes are only for special occasions. I can't wear hard bottom shoes all the time. Can't do it. We used to get on Abu Muslima all the time. He got on his white thobe and his hard bottom shoes. It's like, yo, dude, and you're not even that much older than me. Like, why are you wearing hard bottom shoes? But, you know, whatever floats your boat, that's what makes him comfortable. You know, but at the same token, I couldn't do that. <laughs> I can't wear hard bottom shoes. So I took the thobe and I started, you know, wearing fly sneakers, you know, Air Max, you know, whatever sneakers, you know, that I could find, you know, the Pradas or whatever the case may be. I'm going to find a way to make it work for me. I'm going to find a way to make it work for me. I can't, you know, I can't follow you and what you're doing because that doesn't work for me. I got to do it in a way that I am comfortable. And so for me, converting to Islam, I kind of fit right in with that being different. I didn't mind. I don't mind being different because that's just part of my personality anyway. But for somebody who's a follower and doesn't feel like they can step out on their own and they have to always hide behind a crowd, then representing Islam to the fullest is always going to be a struggle for you. And I want you guys to think about that. If you're finding that being a Muslim, unapologetically Muslim, is a, is a challenge for you, it's a struggle for you, then perhaps the struggle is not Islam. It goes back to you as an individual. You are a person that has always struggled with being your own person. That's just who you are. Nothing wrong with Islam. And so... To make, to make it clear, right, to make it clear is that um, <laughs> we from Newark, we ain't wearing no hard bottoms with, <laughs> I mean, that's the old heads, I mean, the older brothers, you know, uh, the, the earlier generation of Gen, Gen X, right, I'm Gen X, so Gen X starts around 65, 1965, that's, that's, the, that's the older generation of Gen X, I'm on the latter end of Gen X, so, you know, the, the older generation of Gen X, they like to wear hard bottom shoes, you know and I mean? Here again, but I'm not wearing hard bottom shoes. Not at 21 years old. I put on a Thobe. I'm going to wear some Air Max. I'm going to wear some Pradas. I'm going to find some fancy footwear to, you know, to make me stand out, to make me, you know, comfortable in doing what I'm doing, you know, because that's just me, you know, and other people are going to look at you and be like, why are you wearing your Thobe like that? It's just, that's. That's me. That works for me. That works for me. When I got to the Islamic University, brothers was on the, I'm not giving him salams and I'm not talking to this one. And it's just like real schoolboy stuff. And I got there and I'm like, I'm a little older than the rest of the guys that's there. And I'm just like, man, this is kid stuff, man. I don't, I'm not doing that. And I used to walk right past the brothers in the hallway and like, I'm not giving you salams. Like you guys are corny. This is corny. What you guys are doing is corny. This is an opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us to come to the university and study Islam and go back home and benefit our communities. And you guys are here acting like schoolboys, like you in, you know, you're in the fifth grade or sixth grade. I don't want to talk to this person. I don't want to talk to that person. And I used to walk. And this is where I got, you know, oh, he's arrogant. I'm arrogant because I didn't fit in with what you guys were doing. I, I didn't fit in. I didn't want to fit in. I thought it was corny. I thought what you guys were doing, what the what the students of knowledge were doing was corny. I was just happy to be there. I was just happy to be in, in Medina studying Islam. Like I'm just grateful that I'm here and I'm not dead. I'm not in a casket somewhere. I'm in Medina studying Islam. I'm just taking in the whole opportunity. While these guys are here, you know, boycotting one another, not talking to one another. And this person, you know, you know, I'm sorry. I don't fit in with that, man. I'm sorry. I, I'm never going to fit in. There was a time when I felt like as a Muslim, like I just don't belong here. 
I don't belong here. Like, <laughs> and at, at the beginning, I used to feel like that because I thought maybe I was a convert to Islam and maybe the born and raised Muslims or those who have been Muslim for a while, you know, they got the deen all figured out and I'm just still here trying to figure it all out. You know, like I'm just trying to figure it out. And it wasn't that. It's just that I am my own person. I'm not a follower. I'm not a follower. This is the way that I see Islam. This is the way that I'm going to practice Islam. And I don't care what you say. I don't care if it's a scholar. I don't care if it's a student. And I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I believe is best for me. And you, ha you have to be like that. If you are going to get to the truth, because there's so many obstacles, so many hindrances that are going to pull you in so many different directions, all so you do not get to the truth. All so you do not get to the truth and you have to learn how to. You got to navigate, you got to navigate the terrain. And sometimes that's going to make you a cold person. People are going to call you cold. People are going to call you insensitive. People are going to call you arrogant. They're going to call you everything in the book to try to suck you back in to following the crowd and what everybody else is doing. Even as it relates to marriage. There are a lot of sisters right now that are single. Yes, you sisters, I want you to listen. A lot of you sisters are single right now, not because you can't find a brother, not because there are no good brothers, there are no good men, there are no, you know, brothers are not looking for marriage. You are not married right now because you spend too much time trying to appease your clique, trying to appease your crew of friends instead of going after the happiness that you believe is yours. That's that's the that's it in a nutshell. Many of you sisters are single because you are afraid of the backlash that you are going to receive from your sisters in Islam, which is very hypocritical because we should want for our brothers what we want for ourselves. We should want for our sisters what we want for ourselves. But that is just something that we say, not something that we do, something that we say, not something that we do, something that we say, not something that we practice. And so instead of going after this brother or instead of, you know, allowing this brother to pursue you, you are too worried about what your sisters in Islam is going to are going to say. And so you stay away from the situation or you don't go into the situation at all to your own loss. To your own loss. Now, brothers are not worried about what other brothers are going to say. Brothers are worried about, you know other things. <laughs> but sisters, women, you guys are cliques. You're cliquish. You're cliquish. And, you know, you might like this brother, you might like that brother, and then a sister, lo and behold, a sister comes along and says, oh, no, nah, he was married to so-and-so. Oh, no, I don't think that was a good, yo, you're so much better than that. And it's just like, and then you buy into it. You buy into it. That's not to say brothers don't do it, but I, men, we are not cultured like that. Men, a man is going to do what a man is going to do regardless. But women, you guys are cultured to run in cliques and in packs. Many of you. This is one of the reasons why a lot of sisters haven't, you know, gone into polygyny. It's not that you have a problem with polygyny. You have a problem with what sisters are going to say about you going into polygyny. You, not, you don't have a problem with polygyny. You have a problem with what sisters are going to say about you being in polygyny. Oh, you stupid. Oh, why would you do that? You're so much better than that. You know, you deserve better than that. Blah, 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 blah. Right. To suck you back in to where you were. Because you can't stand on your own. It takes a special type of woman to take her own happiness into her own hands. Not all. It takes a certain type of person to take their own happiness into their own hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you responsible for whether or not you're going to paradise or going to hellfire. Every human being, we have fastened his fate to his own neck. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made you responsible for where you're going in the hereafter, whether you're whether it's paradise or hellfire. And that's the greatest form of happiness. Allah has made you responsible. God has made you responsible for the greatest form of happiness, which is bliss in paradise. And if he has made you responsible for the greatest form of your happiness, then by default, he has made you responsible for the lesser form of happiness. And that's your happiness on earth, your paradise on earth. And here again, not all sisters, I'm not saying all sisters, but many, many, because you're too worried about what everybody else is going to say about you, too worried about what your parents are going to say, too worried about what this person is going to say or what that person is going to say. And so you finesse yourself out of your own happiness because of trying to fit in with everybody else. Fortune favors the bold. Understand? Fortune favors the bold. If you are going to achieve happiness, then you have to be bold enough to go get it. You have to be bold enough to go get it. It's not going to drop in your lap. It's not going to fall in your lap. You have to go after it. Same thing with many people who are on the ropes about converting to Islam. Some people know that Islam is the truth, but I can't accept Islam because my parents are Christian or, you know, my folks is Christian and, you know, what they're going to say about me, you know, and, you know, I can't go back to my house you know, and, and, you know, talk to my mom and my dad, or I can't run into my preacher on the street, you know, after I've converted to Islam. So you're going to let an opportunity like accepting Islam, converting to Islam, accepting the truth about God. You're going to let this opportunity pass you by because you can't handle the criticism for people who are not wise enough and not understanding enough to understand your decision. You're going to let this opportunity pass you by? Got to be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. No. So the strangeness of Islam, uh, it began with the Prophet ﷺ emerging with the message of Tawheed in a society that was immersed and enmeshed with shirk, idolatry, kufr, and ignorance on levels that were unprecedented. We're talking about pre-Islamic Arab society where they were burying their baby daughters alive. This is ignorance. No different than America and the type of debaucherous behavior that goes on in, in our society. And we have the audacity to become a moral judge of other people's society. We have the audacity as Americans to be the moral judge of what's going on in other people's society. We, we're not in a position to be the moral judge of anybody's society. Look at the stuff that goes on in our environments. Look at the stuff that we engage in. And this in, includes Muslims. Look at the stuff that we engage in, the debaucherous behavior, the immoral behavior that we engage in in this country. And then we have the audacity to go to another country and become the moral judge of what is going on in other people's countries. Man, you, you have got to be kidding me. We're in no position to be any moral judge of anybody. Look at the stuff that we do in our society. You have fathers molesting their own daughters in this society. You have mothers and mothers' friends molesting their child, the, the, the boys. You have teachers that sleep with their children. Unheard of. This stuff unheard of. Wallahi, I lived in Saudi Arabia for almost 10 years of my life. I have never heard. <laughs> That's not to say that they don't have you know, their stuff, but I have never heard. Some of the stuff that is actually normal behavior in our society going on in any other society. You have got to be kidding me. We have teachers, teachers, grown adults that sleep with teenage children. <laughs> you understand? This is what's going on in our society. You have in some cultures where it's normal for the father to molest the daughter 
for the, the son, the, the, the brother and sister to, you know, yes, it's very normal. Very normal. Very normal. You hear about it all the time. More so today than you did when I was a kid. In the 80s, you, you know, you might heard random situations here and there. In today's time, it's ubiquitous. Happens all the time. Teachers sleeping with their children, with their students. Incest, brother and sister sleeping with each other. Molestation, fathers molesting their daughters. This goes on every single day, every day. And then we have the audacity to say, oh, Prophet Muhammad married Aisha when she was ex you know, this age or that age. Uh, it's hard for me to accept. How dare you? How dare you? It's hard for you to accept. It's hard for you to accept. You got to be kidding me. We live in a society where 70 year old men marrying 15, 16 year old children. Didn't the movie actor, I forget the white guy's name, 70 something years old, didn't he marry his, which was once his, his daughter? His adopted daughter, and then he turned around and married her. Who who was that? What's his name? <laughs> What's his name? The white guy, the actor. I can't remember his name. Woody, not Woody Harrelson. Uh, Woody Allen. Right, exactly. Woody Allen. And that's that's not right. That's not that's not a, like a that's not a. a a, a, a isolated situation. This happens. <laughs> We're talking about somebody 70 years old and you marry what was once your, your adopted daughter and then you turn around and marry her? Nobody says anything. But it's hard for you to understand that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in his late 40s married Aisha at 11 years old. It's hard for you to understand that. Are we talking about something that happened over a millennium ago, over a thousand years ago? And you it's hard for you to understand that over a thousand years ago in a completely different society, completely different culture. And right here in America, just as early as 10 years ago, somebody 70 years old marries his, you know, adopted daughter, you know, as a teenager. And it's hard for you to understand that. You got to be kidding me. This has to be a joke. It has to be a joke. But we don't have, we don't have the moral, <laughs> we don't, who, who put us in the chair to be a moral judge of anybody's society? And I'm, and I'm, this is even with Muslims. Muslim, you hear Muslims saying it's hard for them to accept that. So what does that mean? <laughs> Yeah, subhanAllah. Anyway, the Prophet وسلم, emerged in a society that was riddled with, you know, and immersed in and in, in, in enmeshed in, you know, idolatry, kufr, and ignorance in all forms and manifestations. And Islam emerges as this system of strangeness. It represents, you know, anybody who adopts this I you know, this uh belief. You know, becomes strange. And then the Prophet وسلم, he said that Islam will return to being strange. This will be Al Ghurba, Athania, the second strangeness of Islam. The second strangeness of Islam. And that is because given everything, all of the different phases that Islam went through, people will return right back to that period of ignorance and jahiliyyah that Islam came to liberate them from. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Bada al-Islam gharibah wa sayyudu kama bada gharibah fatuba lil ghurba. Islam started off as strange and it will return to being strange. So give glad tidings to the strangers. Give glad tidings to the strangers. And Ibn Rajab, 
Rahimullah Ta'ala, he kind of walks us through, Ibn Rajab has a whole book on the strangeness of Islam. Ghurbat islam the strangeness of Islam. Ibn Rajab walks through, walks us through how Islam started off strange and the process that it will go through to returning to being something strange. Ibn Rajab, he said, فَلَمَّا بُعِثَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَدْعَا إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ لَمْ يَسْتَجِبْ لَهُ فِي أَوَّلِ الْأَمْرِ إِلَّا وَاحِدْ بَعْدَ وَاحِدْ مِنْ كُلِّ قَبِيلًا He said that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم with the message of Islam, there were only a few people that responded to the message of Islam, the da'wah of Islam at the very beginning. There was only maybe one or two people from each tribe. A tribe may have had a hundred people in it, and out of that hundred people, 50, 60, 70 people, one person converted to Islam. One person. وكان المسلمون في ذاك الوقت مستضعفين. And the Muslims during that time were weak and oppressed. They didn't have resources, they didn't have numbers, they had nothing. Just a handful of them. يَهْرَبُونَ بِدِينِهِمْ إِلَى الْبِلَادِ النَّائِمَ نَائِيَ That they fled with their religion. They ran with their religion. You know, fleeing Mecca, going to Abyssinia twice, fleeing from Mecca to Medina. Fleeing from Mecca to Medina with their religion. Running with their religion. Can you imagine running from one place to another to all to preserve and protect your religion? Can you imagine? Because I can't practice Islam here in this society, so I have to get up, uproot my family, and move to an entirely different environment, all for the purpose of my religion. When we relocate today, most of us, we relocate for the purpose of money. We relocate for money. We relocate for employment opportunities. Can you imagine loving your religion so much that you are willing to uproot your family and move all for the sake of your deen, all for the sake of your religion. And those who have done it before and those who are living that right now know exactly what that feels like. Saying to yourself, I'm going to leave this place because I cannot practice my deen the way that I want to. That's a love for Islam. That is how you know you truly love Islam when your decisions are based upon whether or not this is going to be a better opportunity for me to become a better Muslim and practice my religion. And as I said to you guys before, if you're living in a city, if you're living in a state where you're not able to practice your religion, either because the Muslims are scarce or because Islam is not being practiced correctly in that environment, you have to love Islam enough to pack your family up and move. Move. The earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is spacious. Move. The earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ardullahi wasi'ah. The earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is patient. And so they ran with their religion. Some of them were tortured as a result of their religion. And some of them were killed as a result of their religion. And Ibn Rajab, he said, وَكَانَ الدَّخِلُونَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ غُرَبَا And everyone who entered into Islam at that time, everyone who entered into Islam at that time were considered غُرَبَا, were considered strangers. Here again, strangers to society, not strangers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's two types of strangers. <laughs> There's two types of strangers. There is the stranger to Allah and there is the stranger to society. What we want to be is a stranger to society, not a stranger to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't want to be alienated from Allah, separated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, isolated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The disbelievers and sinful Muslims are alienated, alienated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are strangers, but they're strangers to Allah. 
Whereas we are strangers to society. We're strangers to the debauchery. We're strangers to the immorality. We're strangers to the indecency. We're strangers to the behavior. For, to the behavior that we see going on in society. We're strangers to a Muslim smoking marijuana and coming to the masjid. We're strangers to Muslims drinking at night and then coming to the masjid during the day. We're strangers to that type of behavior. I don't know that behavior. I don't know Muslims who get down like that. I, that's, I'm, I'm a stranger to that. We are strangers for the right reasons, while disbelievers are strangers to God. They don't know God. They're distant from God. They're isolated from God. They're alienated from God by their own hands, by their own behavior, by their own actions. So there's ghurba, al ghurba ghurbatan, that strangeness, alienation is two types. There's the strangeness to society, meaning we're strangers to society because we don't conform to societies. And then there's strangeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are a stranger to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning God doesn't know you. You don't want to be that type of strange. You don't want to be the type of stranger that God doesn't know you. God doesn't acknowledge you because you don't acknowledge him. God doesn't acknowledge you because you don't acknowledge him. Ibn Rajab, he continues, he said, ثم ظهر الإسلام بعد الهجرة. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave prominence to the religion of Islam. Islam became prominent in the land. Islam was given honor and dignity to the Muslims, right? Islam became uppermost in the land. People were entering into Islam in droves. As it is today, it's cool to be Muslim. It wasn't cool to be Muslim in 9-11. It wasn't even cool to wear a beard in 9-11. I had an Arab brother tell me, you probably need to cut your beard now, brother. So I'm not cutting my beard, man. I'm not cutting my beard. No. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Not after 9-11, it wasn't cool to be Muslim. It wasn't cool to have a beard. It wasn't cool to wear hijab. And so some of the same Muslims today, now that it's cool to be Muslim, you know, all your celebrities, your famous top celebrities are mentioning Islam in their rap songs, mentioning Muslims in their rap songs, mentioning Allah in their rap songs. It's cool to be Muslim now. It's cool. Where, you know, going, everybody's going to Dubai and going to the famous mosque, Imam Zayed Mosque in, in Dubai and everybody got on a thobe. You understand? It's cool to be Muslim. You're seeing all your top celebrities go visit Dubai and they got on thobes. You're seeing Rihanna with a headscarf on, with a hijab on. It's cool to be Muslim. Now. But there was a time when it wasn't cool to be Muslim. And that's the hypocrisy. Because as Muslims, how soon do we forget? We forget 9-11 and how tough those times were. From 9-11 to about the time that Barack Obama became president. To about 2008. Those were some rough, rough, rough years. Now all the designers are selling hijab. They're selling oud and, you know, um, Yves Saint Laurent. They got, you know, the oud, the, the oud cologne now. They're selling oud. It's cool to be Muslim and acknowledge Islam in today's time. Muslim politicians, we're getting the Eid off. You know how long Muslims in, in, in inner cities been fighting to have the Eid off? Have the Eid recognized as a national holiday? But today is cool. And we've forgotten about the hard times. We've forgotten about the hard times and the difficult times because those difficult times, they separate the men from the mice. Difficult times separate the men from the mice. And while today everything seems all good, everybody now made converting to Islam a fad. Converting to Islam has now become a fad. 
It's cool to be Muslim. And I just be looking at like some speakers and I'm just like, man, where were you in 2000, 2001? Like you, you popular on social media today, but where the heck were you? You know what I mean? In 2003, 2004. Now, all of a sudden, you're a popular imam on social media, never addressing the issues at hand. But, you know, you're trending, you're, you're popular, you got followers. It's like, where in the world were you in 2003, 2004? Where people were afraid to even open their mouth in public about Islam. Where Muslim preachers and speakers were being arrested, never to be heard from again. Where were you? Where, where were you? You had Muslim imams, clerics within American society that were arrested, never to be heard from again, put in prison for years. I don't have to mention no names. Those of you who were around, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It wasn't cool to be Muslim then. And people shunned Islam. And now it's cool to be Muslim. This is the mockery of the deen. This is mockery of the deen. And this is why Ibn Rajab says that people entered into the religion of Islam in droves. Dakhalu anas fil Islam afwajan. They entered into Islam in droves. That's, that's what we're seeing now. That's what we're seeing now. People entering into the religion of Islam in droves because it's popular, it's cool. But in entering into the religion of Islam today, different than when the Sahaba were entering into the religion of Islam, people are not entering into the religion of Islam for the purpose of becoming, you know, Muslims who actually practice the Quran and Sunnah with the purpose of seeing Islam as the uppermost in the land. They're not converting it to Islam for that purpose. They're not converting to Islam and then trying to figure out how they can use their expertise to help Islam become the more prominent religion, the more dominant force in the world, understanding that the world needs Islam. This society, there is nothing more that this society needs than Islam. That is a fact. The mental health issues. The drug and alcohol problems, the substance abuse problems, the high rates of divorce, the high rates of teen pregnancy, the high rates of uh, um, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, the high rates of murder, the high rates of criminal behavior. All of those problems can be solved with the religion of Islam. That is a fact. You need to look no further than those of us who converted to Islam, who are practicing Muslims, who once used to be a part of that society. We used to be a part of that society. And then we left that, converted to Islam, and look at how Islam began slowly to solve all of our problems. The problems that we got from living in this society. The problems that we had living in this society and we converted to Islam and all of those problems in due time begin to dissipate. All of those problems one by one begin to disappear because of the religion of Islam. This society needs Islam. And so while people are converting to Islam today, their conversion to Islam does nothing for the greater good of the Muslim community. It does nothing for the greater good of the community. It does only benefit their individual souls, but it does nothing for the larger Muslim community. It's a selfishness. It's a selfishness. Then Ibn Rajab, he says, وَتَوُفِّيَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ وَالْأَمْرَ عَلَى ذَارِكَ وَأَهْلُ الْإِسْلَامِ عَلَى غَايَةٍ مِنَ الْإِسْتِقَامَةِ That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم died and that was the last thing that he saw of his community is that the Muslim community were the upper hand in the land. 
and the Muslims were at the highest peak of istiqama, of steadfastness in their religion, in their religious practices. And they remained like that until the two years after Abu Bakr was the Khalifa. Then Shaytan began plotting, scheming, figuring out a way to distract the Muslims and to separate and divide the Muslim community. Shaytan cannot stand to see unity amongst the Muslims and harmony amongst the Muslims. Shaytan operates in chaos. Understand that. Shaytan operates in chaos. Anything Shaytan gets involved with, it becomes chaotic. Anything that Shaytan gets involved with, it becomes chaotic. Whether that is marriages, whether that is communities, whether that is societies, whether that are businesses, whether that is friendships, doesn't matter. Anything that shaitan gets involved with, it becomes chaotic. Shaitan operates in chaos. You look at any situation that is chaotic, at the root of it, at the root of it is shaitan. Shaitan cannot stand to see harmony, peace. He hates it because it puts him out of business. This is the same reason why uh, the, the, the organizations that, that run these companies, music companies, why they continue to push debauchery because that's what sells. Sex sells. Debauchery sells. Conscious music doesn't sell. It's not going to make any money. So they got to keep the wheel going. So one minute is this person, next minute is that person, but they're all pushing the same agenda because that's how you keep the machine going. That's how you know it's from Shaitan. And now Shaitan is now fragmenting the Muslim community. Shaitan operates in chaos. He operates in chaos. Raw capitalism. I love it. Because capitalism is all about supply and demand. No matter what the demand is, we will find a supply for it. Doesn't matter how debaucherous, doesn't matter how immoral the demand is, we will find a supply for it. Capitalism. At the head of it, none other than Shaitan. None other than Shaitan. Shaitan operates in chaos. Make no mistake about that. He hates harmony. He hates peace. And this is why when the Prophet ﷺ left the Muslim Ummah, he left us with tools to help us repair our relationships, knowing that we are human beings and we get into you know squirmishes, we get into issues with one another. And although we're human, although our relationships are tested, the Prophet ﷺ gave us the remedy on how to repair our relationships. The Prophet ﷺ gave us the remedy on how to repair our relationships in the event that our relationships take a left turn, go in another direction. We have tools in our religion. We have provisions in our religion to help us solve that problem so the situation doesn't remain that way. So the situation doesn't remain that way. Because a society cannot function where there is chaos. Societies cannot function where there is chaos. What, why do you think we have so many tools, so many narrations, so many hadith, so many texts in our religion to help us put out fires, to solve fires, to solve problems? Very quickly. Expediently. Not to wait, to solve the problems ahead of time. There's provisions in our religion to help us avoid conflict. To avoid the conflict altogether. Because a society cannot sustain itself when it is functioning in chaos. 
It can't sustain itself. And so shaitan, as the Prophet ﷺ said, قَدْ يَئِسَ الشَّيْطَانِ أَنْ يَعْبُدُوهُ الْمُصَلُّونَ فِي جَزِيرَةِ الْعَرَبِ وَلَكِنَّ التَّحْرِيشِ بَيْنَكُمْ The Prophet ﷺ, he said, shaitan has given up all hope that he will be worshipped in the Arabian Peninsula. He's given up hope that anybody's going to worship him. He knows that once the believer understands Tawheed, they will never worship shaitan. However, what is his entry point? What is his entry point? He says, shaitan has given up all hope that he will be worshipped in the Arabian Peninsula by those who establish regular salat. Like in the tahrish baynakum. But he causes division between you through conflict. He causes division between you through conflict. He also causes division, as Ibn Rajab mentions here, his two famous ways to cause division between the believers, a shahwat wa shubuhat. Shahwat, which is your lowly desires, your animalistic impulses. People go to sin and disobedience as a result of following their animalistic impulses. That's one of the ways that shaitan uses to create division amongst the believers. This group is, wants to be obedient to Allah. This group decides they're going to dabble in what is haram. This group figures they're going to have one foot in, one foot out. That's us. That's the Muslim community as a whole right now. You have some of us who try to stay obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you have those of us who I'm going to do me. I know this is Islam, but I'm going to continue doing me. And then you have those of us who got one foot in, one foot out. Sin and disobedience. Shahwat. The Prophet Sallallahu said, إِنَّمَا أَخْشَى عَلَيْكُمْ الشَّهْوَاتِ أَلَّتِي فِي بُطُونِكُمْ وَفُرُوجِكُمْ وَمُضِلَّاتِ الْفِتْنَةِ The Prophet Sallallahu said, I fear for you. The one thing that I fear for you, meaning for my ummah, is a shahwat, lowly desires, animalistic impulses, that which is in your stomach, meaning the appetite, your appetite for food, and the appetite of sex. Your sexual appetite and your appetite for food. The two types of appetites that will destroy the human being, that will destroy the Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu said, the, the thing that, that if you can guarantee me what is between your tongue, what is between your lips, and what is between your legs, I can guarantee you paradise. Because these are the things that destroy the Muslim, following your desires. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا أَخْشَى عَلَيْكُمْ The thing, the one thing that I fear for, for my ummah, fear for you all, is a shahwat, your lowly desires. أَلَّتِي فِي بُطُونِكُمْ the appetite of the stomach and the appetite for sex. I want you guys to pay attention because many of our struggles come from one of those two things. Our appetite for food and our appetite for sex. Our appetite for food, how is that dangerous? How is that detrimental? Because when you don't have control over what you put into your body, you are what you eat. You are what you eat. Especially in today's time with all of the chemicals that they're putting in the food. You are what you eat. You don't pay attention to the things that you're putting in your body and then you trying to explain and understand why you do some of the behaviors that you do or why you engage in some of the behaviors that you engage in. Why that is trickled down to your children and the type of stuff that your children do. Many of us beat our children, yell at our children, get mad at our children when your children are just a DNA specimen, a DNA version of you and what you were consuming while you were pregnant with them or before your wife became pregnant with them. The appetite of food, the appetite of the stomach and the appetite for sexual intimacy. Right. And these are the things that motivate animals. Right. So you literally become an animal. And this is where we are in today's society with capitalism. We've literally become consumers. We become animals. Essentially. We've become consumers. 
anything that we desire, our corporations rush to try to find the supply for it. Oh, that's what people want today? We'll go, you go on Amazon, you can find anything you want on Amazon. I mean, anything, anything, whatever your heart desires. Anything that you need, anything you want, anything you desire, go to Amazon and you'll find it. And if Amazon, if Amazon, Amazon doesn't have it, all you got to tell them is that's what you're looking for and some corporation or company will create it. That's a fact. This is the false agenda. This is the false paradise because in paradise, whatever you think will come to you. In paradise, whatever you think about will come to you. And so Shaitan is trying to create paradise on earth. Shaitan is trying to create paradise on earth. It's a false paradise. It's a false paradise. And Allah warns us about this all throughout the Quran, but we don't read the Quran. Allah is warning us about the false paradise of this world that Shaitan offers us. It's false because it's temporary. It's false because it's harmful to the soul. It gives you a temporary rise in dopamine. It gives you a temporary shot of happiness and joy. But it doesn't last and it keeps you chasing. You want more. The more you get, the more you want. This is your false paradise. This is your false paradise right here. Shaitan has created it for you. So much so that you have people who say, people like Dr. Umar who said, oh, I want, this is my paradise right here. Ain't no paradise in the hereafter. Paradise is right here on earth and I want mine right now. This is your Dr. Umar Johnson. This is your Umar Johnson who wants paradise right now. Right, the false paradise. The temporary pleasures of the dunya. Right. What's his paradise right now? This was what Minister Farrakhan said. Minister Farrakhan said there is no hereafter. They don't believe in the hereafter. I don't know if they changed that since. They changed their Akida every other year. They're changing their Akida grabbing bits and pieces from the belief system of Islam and then incorporating in it in their religion because the nation of Islam is not orthodox Islam. Make no mistake about it. They add, they pinch, they cherry pick what they want and they continue to add to the religion that they've created. But there was a time that they didn't believe in a hereafter. Farrakhan said it himself. They don't believe in a hereafter. Paradise and hell is right here on earth. I don't know what they believe in today's time, but that was once one their beliefs. And if you're part of a religion that changes the belief system as they move along, then it, it, there has to be something wrong with that. For those of you who are followers of the nation and you're following this man-made religion that continues to add and subtract beliefs. As the time goes on, like at some point you have to come to the realization that this can't possibly be from God. This can't possibly be from God. You don't get to change the doctrine, the belief system as time goes on. It doesn't evolve with time. The belief system in Islam has been set in stone from the very beginning. They believe in the hereafter, but they say that you create heaven uh, or hell with your own thinking. Here again, philosophizing. Yeah, man. You can't change the doctrine of the religion. <laughs> you can't change the doctrine, you know, as the time goes on and you, you're evolving. Oh, the nation of Islam is evolving and they're, you know, becoming more orthodox Sunni Islam. They will never be Sunni Islam until they abandon that doctrine and they convert to Islam, Sunni Islam, orthodox Islam from the very beginning. 
You cannot bring that with you into Islam. <laughs> you have to check that at the door. You don't get to be indoctrinated by man-made you know, beliefs, man-made belief system, and then come into Islam with that and say, well, the minister used to say, or this one used to say, no, Islam has its own set of rules, their own set of beliefs that have already been written in stone from the, in, from the very beginning. Yeah, if they are practicing Sunni Islam, that means that they have abandoned that doctrine. They converted to Islam, you know, from the beginning and they embraced all of Islam without contradicting it based upon man-made beliefs, man-made doctrines. And so uh, shahwat, their lowly desires. And then the second way that shaitan has misguided and misled people is through shubuhat, doubts and misconceptions. Doubts and misconceptions, and this has also fragmented the Muslim community. You got Shiite, you got Sunni, you got Maturidi, you got Fulani and Fulani, all of these different groups all of all over the place. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kullu Hizbin Bima Ladehim Ferihun, every group, every party, every sect rejoicing, rejoicing at what they believe is with them of the truth. Everybody claiming to be on the truth. Everybody claiming to be on the truth. Fragmented the Muslim community even further. And so the few who remain. He said, we are not followers of Minister Louis Farrakhan. We follow our divine leader, teacher, and guide, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Got you, with all due respect. But when you enter into your grave... When you enter into your grave, there's only one man the angel is going to ask you about. And that man is not Elijah Muhammad. That man is not Elijah Muhammad. There's only one man, the angel, Munkar and Nakir, these two angels, when they come to you in your grave, there's only one man that these angels are going to ask you about. And that is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. They're going to ask you, who was your Lord? Man Rabbuk, who's your Lord? Madinuk, what was your religion? Wa man nabiyuk, wa ma taqulu fi rajul. And what do you say about the man that was sent to you? Not Elijah Muhammad, not Master Farad Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is your guide. Allah says in the Quran, Yawma nad'u kullu unasin bi imamihim. On the day of judgment, we will call every nation to stand behind their imam. On the day of judgment, we will call every nation to stand behind their imam. I don't want to hear the doctrine that he gave for our people in the hemisphere. You don't get to take it upon yourself to decide what your people are going to hear or what they're not going to hear. When Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent his companions out to give da'wah, to call people to Islam, he said the first thing you call them to be la ilaha illallah. That invalidates your doctrine from the very beginning because the first thing that your doctrine should have called your people to should have been la ilaha illallah. You understand? The first thing that your doctrine, if you're calling in this hemisphere and you're calling your people to Islam, the first thing that you should have called your people to would have been to accept God as one without any partners, not being reincarnated in the man known as Master Farad Muhammad or anybody else. That is the first call to Islam. That is the first call to Islam. And that is something that any black man, white man, any culture, any relation, you know, whatever your cultural connection is, anyone can understand that. That is not what the message, that is not the message of the nation of Islam. The message was that Master Farad Muhammad was God reincarnated. Don't tell me, I know exactly what your doctrine is. Master Farad Muhammad was God reincarnated. 
and Elijah Muhammad was the final messenger or the messenger sent to the black man. That those two things invalidates completely the Shahada, which is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Do you understand? I want you. I want you to listen because if you have already told yourself that this is the truth, you're never going to be able to accept what I'm saying. You can't have a fixed mindset. You have to have a growth mindset. And I'm taking it that you are listening to me, that you jumped on my live today because you have a growth mindset. You want to grow. But let me tell you something. The whole origin, the foundation of the doctrine of the, na of the nation of Islam completely invalidates the Shahada. You accepted Master Farad Muhammad as God reincarnated and you accepted Elijah Muhammad as uh, Elijah Muhammad as the final messenger to the black man. Both of those things invalidates la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. It invalidates the origin of what makes you a Muslim. And that is that God is alone. He has no partners. He has no sons. He does not come back to the world reincarnated in anybody's form. You understand? In anybody's form. And Muhammad ibn Abdullah is the last final prophet and messenger sent to mankind until Yom al -Qiyama. The origin of the nation of Islam, the foundation of your doctrine completely invalidates the Shahada. And so I hold and many Muslims hold that followers of the nation of Islam are not Muslims because the foundation of your doctrine what makes you a follower of the nation of Islam by default invalidates your shahada as an orthodox Muslim. I'm just telling you that. And in order for you to accept new information, you have to remove the information that contradicts it. Otherwise, you're going to have a cognitive bias you're always going to look for the information that coincides with what you already believe and you'll never be able to hear anything else. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hadi, hadi al-ibad. He is the one who guides his servants. I don't. I'm just explaining to you what the, what the deal is and you can let those chips fall wherever they may. And I say that with all due respect. I do appreciate you listening. I do appreciate you tuning in. And I hope that inshallah ta'ala, some of what I said that you have at least, you have at least just an inkling, an inkling of, you know, subjectivity within you or objectivity, excuse me, uh, you're objective enough to listen to actually try to get to the truth of the matter. At the end of the day, if you want to be rightly guided, ask God, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you. Ask Allah right now, oh Allah, if what this man is saying is the truth, then guide me to it. And let God do the rest. Let God do the rest. Okay, so these two fitting of shahwat and shubuhat, doubts and misconceptions, as well as uh, as well as um, uh, lowly desires, these two things have continued to grow and to become part of you know what is fragmenting and separating the Muslim community until today's time. And so the few who remain upon what the Prophet Sallallahu was upon when he died will be the few amongst the many who will have all but abandoned Islam altogether. And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu said, Tuba lil ghuraba, glad tidings or paradise for the ghuraba, the strangers. The Sahaba asked the Prophet Sallallahu Wa Sallam, al ghuraba ya Rasulullah, and who are the strangers, O Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet Sallallahu Wa Sallam said, Alladina yuslihuna idha fasad al nas. Those who seek to remain pious while everybody else has become corrupt. Meaning, you are still a stranger. Because while you look out and the vast majority of Muslims are pretty much doing them, you choose to stick to the Quran and the Sunnah and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not down with what everybody else is doing. So your strangeness is to the people, not to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your strangeness is to the people 
and the society, not to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. al ghurba ghurbatan strangeness is two types. There are two types of strangeness. There's the strangeness to Allah where you are isolated from God and God doesn't know you or recognize you or you are a stranger to the people because you stick closely to obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is something that the vast majority of people have abandoned. Yeah. Those who seek to remain pious while the vast majority have become corrupt. And in another narration, the Prophet said, The strangers are those group of people who remain righteous and pious and they are few while the vast majority have become corrupt and evil. And they are many. So being the minority who sticks to the Quran and the Sunnah while the vast majority are preoccupied with their desires or misguided by doubts and misconceptions qualifies you to be a stranger and it also qualifies you for the promise of paradise. Do you want to be a stranger or do you want to be a stranger? Do you want to be a stranger to Allah or do you want to be a stranger to society because of Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. You got to pick your side. But you can't be both. Brothers and sisters, you cannot be both. You have to pick your side. You can't be both. You can't be cool with society and then come back to God and you're cool with God. It doesn't work like that. you cool with God and you don't rock with society. And I'm using modern vernacular so that you understand what I'm saying. You're good with God and you're not good with society. Because you can see the flaws and, you know, Everything, the misguidance, you can see it clearly so you don't want no parts of it. So you stick with being cool with God, but you're not cool with everybody else or you're cool with everybody else, but you're estranged from God. It all depends on you. You got to pick a side, though. How do you explain this concept to your students? What kinds of examples do you give them to kind of help them digest? Well, I don't have to explain this to, in, in these particular words to my students because, number one, these are children who are born and raised in the religion. So they already have this. I, com I communicate with my students in a way where I want them to embrace Islam and, and, and just bask in the greatness that Islam has to offer them. I don't have to convince them that what they're seeing out in the world is not part of Islam because they already know that. Their fitra hasn't been corrupted yet. My students in, in school, their fitra hasn't been corrupted. Many of us, we have been exposed to the world. We've been exposed to the world. So we've been bedazzled by the glitter and the glamour of the world. We've had some worldly experience and so we are trying to unlearn everything that shaitan has taught us. Whereas children, they don't have to unlearn. You're just inserting the information into the blank spaces that are there. We got to erase the sentence and then replace the sentence with a different sentence. We're unlearning. Children, they don't have to unlearn because they haven't learned yet. All you have to do is fill in their blank spaces. You understand? So children, they don't have to unlearn things. They haven't had enough life experience to have to unlearn and unpack a lot of the stuff. We come from, you know, those of us who were born and raised Muslim as well as those of us who converted to Islam. We've had some life experiences. And shaitan has, you know, done a number on many of us. So we got to unlearn a lot of this stuff. And that's exactly what I'm trying to help you guys do now. Trying to help you unlearn this stuff. And the quicker you unlearn this stuff and you gravitate towards Islam and you hold on to that, you will become, you will fall in love with Islam. And the dunya and the world and everything, that, like when I'm out in public, I literally look like I'm in the twilight zone, man. I just be looking at people like, what in the world is going on? Like, I literally feel out of place when I'm outside. I'm not a really a fun person. I mean, like I'm I'm 
I'm a comedian, you know, when you get to know me, but when I'm out, I'm not a sociable person, you know, I can be if I have to be, but I just be looking at the world like, my gosh, man, man, Allah guide these people, man, you know, and you just feel out of place, like, I don't belong here, I don't belong here. We take take our children to like uh, uh we went to like Atlantic City, and we took our children to um the 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 um the 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 water the water park in Atlantic City. We took our children there, and I mean it's a bunch of kids there, and you got women with bikinis on. It's just like why do you have a bikini on and their children? This is a children's park. <laughs> This is a children's park. Why do you have a bikini on? There's nobody here checking for you. I promise you. These are men here with children, women here with children. Like, like everybody here is with their kids. And you got on a bikini. Why? Why? And it's just like, man. Oh, my gosh. You, you just be trying to make sense of stuff that just doesn't. It's never going to make sense to you. And so when I'm out, it's just like, it's depressing. It's depressing, man. Literally, man. You just, you know, I'm just shaking my head the whole time I'm out. Like, my gosh, what in the world is going on here, man? You know, you just hoping that somebody asks you a question and open up a conversation so you can begin, you know, and then you kind of lay something on them that they weren't even really prepared for. And it's just like, you know, I went into the bank this morning, the lady at the counter, she was like, so what do you have planned today? I said, well, you know, today is Friday. It's our Islamic service day. You know, I come off real cocky and, you know, real. I do that purposely because I want them to feel, I want them to feel the greatness of Islam. She's like, you know, what are you doing today? It's Friday. What's going on today? And I'm just like, oh, it's our Islamic service day. And, you know, we're, we're, you know, I'm going to the service. I'm going to the mosque today. And she's like, whoa, wait a minute. You just I, I'm not ready for that. And it's just like, well, you asked and I'm telling you. And then at that point, they start to see their world shrinking because you're talking about your world as if it's so great. And it draws them in. That's a form of da'wah. I'm like, yeah, you know, today is our uh, our um our service day. I'm going to the mosque today, and you know, after you know the mosque, she's like, oh, great, that's great, you know. <laughs> she like, dag man, I should have never opened my mouth. I should have never asked him anything. Yeah. Yeah, man, you you gotta make these people feel the happiness and the greatness of what you are a part of because they're already interested. They're looking at you and you just, as a Muslim, you look interesting. You look interesting. There's something about you. There's something about you that is drawing people in. And sometimes, you know, I can have a look on my face that says, you know, it's the resting Negro face. You know, women have the resting you know what face and I got the resting Negro face and it's just like, don't talk to me, but there's something about you. There's an aura. There's an energy that you give off that people are just like, and this guy looks very interesting. I want to know what's going on. Like, how does he have this type of confidence? And he walks in a room and it's just like, everything stops. And this is like, where is he getting this confidence from? And they, they want to ask you, they want to come over to you and they want to just know, you know, what's going on and what you're into. And I'm just waiting for that moment because soon as you open up that door, right, sometimes it could be your garment, sometimes it could be your thobe, sometimes it could be your beard. Guy will come up to me, oh man, your beard look nice, man. It's like, yeah, I'm Muslim, man. Like, this is a slam, man. This, is, this, ain't, this ain't a fad. This is part of my religion. So, oh, y'all got y'all got to grow your beers like that. Boom, you just opened up the door. Now let's have that conversation. <laughs> As a customer service script, they, they mandated to uh, engage you with, but they haven't trained them for the response. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. They haven't been trained for the response. Okay, so we'll stop here, inshallah, because there's so much more to the khutbah, inshallah. Perhaps we'll save that for another 
uh, another time. But you guys can always go back and listen to the khutbah, inshallah ta'ala, to get the, you know, to get the, um, the details of what we talked about. So uh, hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, you guys make the right choice to be the ghuraba, the those who are strangers to the world, not strangers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you bask in the greatness of Islam. Wallah al brothers and sisters, we are sitting on something that is great. We're sitting on a gold mine. You Muslim right now, you're sitting on a gold mine. The best thing that you can do is to continue to invest in your deen. The more you grow it, the more you're going to benefit from it. And the more you grow your religion, and you grow your religion by learning about it. Inshallah, I'll, I'll try to cut off the comments during the khutbah. Sometimes uh, I'm, I'm just kind of like getting into the masjid. I set my phone up and I just push start and jump on the minbar. So I'm not even thinking about turning off, you know, the uh, the, the comments. And I, I do realize that that can be a distraction for those who are trying to listen. So inshallah, I'll try to be more cognizant of that. Inshallah, ta'ala. there was a troll on there. Yeah, it happens. It happens. It happens. So with that being said, inshallah ta'ala, we'll, we'll stop here, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, I saw a couple of donations that came in, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, we're still waiting for five people who can donate $1,000. Uh, let's bring it down to two people. Are there two people listening that can donate $1,000? We need $9,300 to pay off the for the demolition, demolition project, inshallah ta'ala. We want to demolish the building that is sitting on the property now. So that we can begin construction. Just about finished with the paperwork. There's a couple of items that we need to do. Uh, we need to make one more payment. And then there's some other items that we need to take care of. All of it costs us in the range of $9,300. For the past couple of days, we've collected $4,000. Uh, $4,000, inshallah ta'ala. Which means that we are still in need of $5,300. So I would like to collect that tonight if we can. So we can demolish the building, inshallah ta'ala. I'll stream it live so you can see the building being demolished. So inshallah ta'ala, we can see uh, the, the, the path being cleared so that we can begin building. Um, is there two people listening that can donate $1,000? If you have $1,000 in your account, you can use Cash App, you can use PayPal, or you can use Zelle. The Cash App is uh, the Cash App sign, Rowda, R-A-W-D-A-H. R-A-W-D-A-H, Rowda Islamic Center. Rowda Islamic Center is the Cash App. I'll, uh, I'll actually post it here so you can see it. Rowda Islamic Center. Uh, the the current structure does not uh, it, it's not it's not functional as it is. It, the building has to be demolished because we're building two floors to the masjid, and the current structure cannot support a second floor. So we have to demolish the building. It's rickety anyway. The 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 beams and everything in it is rickety. So we're just gonna knock it down and start from the ground up. Plus the the blueprint that we've already paid for is is already done from the ground up anyway. So there's no going back from that. But, you know, the the um, Arab Masjid, the pa pre predominantly Pakistani Masjid here in North Delaware, Masjid Ibrahim Islamic Society in Delaware, during Ramadan, they raised $950,000. And they just bought the property next door to them. And, uh, you know, I, I understand what we're dealing with in our community, but... Um, we we have to step our you know our donation game up. We have to step we have to step it up. I do understand that people have bills and you have other things, but sadaqah does not cause your wealth to decrease. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that sadaqah does not cause your wealth to decrease. These brothers and sisters donated a total of nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Within the last few nights of Ramadan. If you don't have $1,000, send what you have. You have $500, you have $250. You know, anybody, everybody that's listening right now between the people on Instagram, uh, Facebook, as well as YouTube. 
If you have $200, $300, $250, $950,000 they raised within the last 10 nights of Ramadan and they bought the property next door to them. While we sitting here trying to collect $250,000 so that we can build a masjid from the ground up. It's just like, come on, man. Come on. We're going to be here, you know, for the next two years. And what's going to end up happening is that by the time we finish purchasing this property, if we don't have the money to build the building, then we're going to have to end up selling the property. I mean, what do we just sit on the property and we still collect? I'm not going to be Umar Johnson, with all due respect, 10 years, you know, trying to raise money to start a school. I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not doing that. Because if it takes us that long to put up money, then we don't actually deserve the property that we're aiming for. We don't deserve it. I'm not doing that. You probably got another year with me. You think I like going live, asking you guys to donate and still being responsible for maintaining the property, paying the bills, paying the, you know taxes and stuff like that. Uh, that's, that's a headache. That's a headache. Meanwhile, you have other communities who put their money where their mouth is. They want a property, they want a building, and they put their money up and they make it happen. <laughs> they put the money up and they make it happen. $950,000 within the last few nights of Ramadan. <laughs> it's just like, you got to be kidding me, man. We can't raise $250,000. Come on, man. We got to do better. And we don't deserve to have the facility. We don't deserve to have it. We don't deserve it. And it is what it is. I'll continue to go to different masajid and give khutbahs and, you know, periodically give lectures here and there. And during Ramadan, I'll do my series. And that's it. That's the extent of our religion. That's the extent of, you know, what we are willing to put into building a, a, an Islamic community. That's what we're willing to put in. But I'm not going to be here 10 years still collecting. I'm not going to be here 2026 20, still asking you for donations for the building. I'm not going to do that. We just sell the property and rent something and keep it pushing. <laughs> we could have rented something. We started to do that. We're going to rent something and say, you know, just do what other communities do and just rent out a place and just keep paying on it. But we came across an opportunity where we could purchase a property and we had the money. So we said, OK, let's put the money down. And, you know, now that we're kind of into it, it's just like, do we really want this or we don't want it? But I'll tell you what, if we're still here at this time next year, still asking for money, then it might be easier to just sell the property, get our money back and go rent something and call it a day. Call it a masjid, you know, because we don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. So I saw that someone made a donation for a thousand dollars. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Jazakallah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place it in your scales of good on the day when you will need it the most. Even if you don't have $1,000, you have $250, you have $200, $150, uh, please donate, contribute, help build a house for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Invite some of those people who raise a $900,000. Well, here's the kicker. The people who raise a $900,000 in many instances, they're not going to donate anything. <laughs> I pray alongside of these people. I see these people every single day. And many of them know that I'm trying to build a masjid. They're not going to give me anything. Because nobody wants African-American Muslims to be sitting at the table. I did the unthinkable and decide to pull up a chair and create my own table. I'm not asking for a seat at nobody else's table. Not at all. And nobody, no cultural group wants to share their wealth, wants to share what they have with African-Americans. That's a fact. I pray with these people every day. I work at the school over there. I work at the school over there. I pray next to them every single day for Salah. And many of them know that I'm trying to build a masjid. <laughs> they're not, they're not going to give me a dime. Why would they? You think they want us to be competition? 
No, as long as we're struggling, giving fifty dollars here, hundred dollars here, ten dollars here, as long as we're doing that, we will never, we will never have a seat at the table. We are trying to create our own destiny here. This is something that most inner city African American Muslims don't even attempt to do. I think Ali Davis mentioned that to you guys before. This is historical. We don't usually do this. We don't usually take this approach. Our approach is usually to rent a facility. We play it safe, rent a facility for 10, 15, 20 years, and then maybe we got up enough money to move into a facility. That's usually our trajectory. That's usually our journey, our path. But they're not going to give us a dime. You think that they're going to write us a check for $50,000 so we can build a masjid and be in competition with them? You got to be kidding me. No cultural group wants to share their wealth, wants to share their fortunes with African-American Muslims. We are a threat. Always. That's how you know we are some magnificent people, man. We are some magnificent people because people are terrified of us. Sitting at the table. Terrified of us sitting at the table. Terrified of us having our own. Because when we have our own, we make an impact. We change the trajectory. We change the trajectory. You can't know. You, once we get ours, you can't function in, in the mediocrity that you've been functioning in for so long. You can't do that anymore because now people start to look at what we're doing. People start to look at and turn their attention towards what we're doing. Yeah, we are a threat everywhere we go, which is why doors are always closing in our faces. We are a threat everywhere we go. We, our problem is we don't know how to organize and work together. And that is our Achilles heel. Our problem is not that we are not great not that we don't compete, not that we can't compete with anyone. We create culture. Every other culture out there pulls from African-American culture. We are a threat, but our biggest mistake, our Achilles heel is our inability to organize and to cooperate and work with one another for the greater good. Our selfishness and our individual, our extreme individualism Absolutely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala work, you know, reward you all. Uh, I do appreciate those of you who donated, those of you who wanted to donate and you don't actually have it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in our wealth, increase us in our health, increase us in our understanding of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with a facility that we can begin teaching from and begin spreading the da'wah of Islam in this area because Lord knows they need it in Delaware. Lord have mercy, they need it here bad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. I have to go, it's time for Salatul Maghrib inshallah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala adihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira. Wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.